So now we have um, a discussion session. So can I ask the four panelists to come up here? Um, and then we'll take uh, questions from the audience, uh, but please wait for the microphone to arrive before you start talking. Hi, uh, this question is for Richard. You know, you have lots of data. How do you, what's, what criteria do you use uh, to determine what data to keep and what to throw away? I never had a microphone, but never mind. Uh, this is, of course, fairly hard, but uh, you remember the picture of the CMS Higgs candidate. Uh, that had two things sticking out towards the bottom. Uh, those were the pictorial representation of the response of the detector to two, uh, two photons. And what we look for are things that, if you like, are visually striking, like that, uh, that, that are, have the potential to be visually striking because they involve things that are otherwise quite rare. And the, you know, the most typical things that are quite rare are, for instance, when you collide protons together, which, uh, which are bags of hadronic matter, that what you get out of that are things like photons and electrons and muons, which aren't there in the beginning, and they come out really fast and really distinctively in some direction. That says something interesting happened. So we do have, it's, you know, we do have quite a number of signatures, so-called, that are associated with the probability that something that may be quite new, that we don't understand, but that is, is new and measurable is happening. Uh, another one is to have a huge imbalance in the detected energy from this collision, meaning that something you didn't see went off in this direction and carried an awful lot of energy and momentum. And if you see something hugely imbalanced like that with a lot of missing energy that's disappeared somehow, this is again, you know, you don't need to know much about physics to know if that happens, something strange has happened, you better look at it and find out. So that's the sort of thing. You have a question here? I guess this is a question to uh, uh, both Richard and Jeff. Um, what we hear a lot about when in, people try to scale their infrastructures, and I, I heard this from you, Richard, was the nearly unsustainable manpower cost. My question is, do you believe this is an operations problem or is it an architecture problem? Um, I mean, I think one of the key aspects of designing these systems is to build them in such a way that the operational overhead is fairly low. You're never going to get it to zero, but you want the systems to be able to be operated kind of largely in an automated fashion. I think as you look at the progression of systems we've built, you know, the later ones are more and more automated and require less and less kind of operational effort to deal with. Um, but it's largely a design issue considering those kinds of things when you're building the system. So I would certainly echo that, that uh, one of the <clears throat> problems is when you have young people doing things who you know, didn't do it before and realize how expensive it is to maintain what you've created, then you tend to get these systems that, that work but they're very hard to sustain because of their architecture. And this is one case where it does turn out that having a few older and wiser people around can be very beneficial. So I know from my experience that when you get the architecture right of one of these things that grows into a global distributed system, the, the operation and maintenance cost can go down by a factor of 10. That's not to say we always do it, but we know that we ought to be doing it, and, some, and we have some pointers and some existence proofs that we can do this. So, you know, it's the same story. Uh, I have a question for Jeff. Do you believe that when you built um, Bigtable that had you approached it and designed it to be spanner at that time that it would have failed because it would have been too wide in scope? Uh, yes. <coughs> Uh, I mean, I think we were already biting off a fair amount of stuff in building this within single data center kind of scalable storage system. Uh, and I think also trying to bite off wide area consistency issues would have been um, 
kind of a lot of things to take on in one sort of new system. Hi, uh, this is also for Jeff on the same area. I was curious on, uh, you talked about the difficulty of moving people from Bigtable to Spanner and uh, is it that wide area consistency and multi-row transactional consistency that, is that their motivation for moving and how many, what percentage of people are sort of unserved and want to move but onto Spanner? Uh, I, I mean, I think the big issue is just that there's a lot of existing code and data in Bigtable systems and um, migrating is kind of painful and if your system already kind of works, there's not that much motivation. If you're building something brand new from scratch, you can take advantage of the nicer features that are present in Spanner. Uh, but if you already have a system that works, then the kind of the cost of moving is sometimes harder to justify. And it's kind of up to individual teams whether that makes sense or not. Uh, a question for Richard. Um, how do you possibly introduce risk taking in these big scientific projects as you're building them? Because Google obviously does it and, and they've been successful, but I guess not everyone has Jeff around. So how can you possibly do that? Well, we, we do come from a conservative world. I mean, apart from all the young people and young scientists who are, of course, not conservative in the least, by the time you get to Frank or the funding agencies, or, you know, high energy physics, and you propose to do something that is going to be a 20-year project, uh, then you get a very conservative approach. Uh, and things that this gives rise to are especially egregious in computing. So if you look, at the big projects that I've been involved in over the years uh, in physics, and you look actually at the original proposal for how to do the computing for these things, the factor by which this is unrealistically low is usually between 100 and 1,000. Yet that proof that at least we could do this physics in this horrible, miserable way with, you know, two VAX 11780s or whatever it was in, instead of uh, great racks full of, uh, of much faster processors. This sort of thing is essential. Uh, you see it again now with the, the big telescope projects where uh, LSST has been constrained to show that they really can uh, demonstrate a system that is obviously scalable to their petabyte scale object catalog. And uh, of course, it's completely unclear what they will really use when they get data. <laughs> Sorry, uh, of course, they will use this. So <laughs> but you know, that's the, that's the way it goes. So uh, we, we risk making ourselves look ridiculous by having our names on documents that turn out to be wrong by good factors of a thousand. And in my personal experience, I remember that myself and Harvey Newman, uh, professor of physics at Caltech, designed a, the computing system for this big experiment at CERN, the L3 experiment, and we were roundly and publicly criticized by one of the CERN directors for the total irresponsibility of what we said we were going to do because it was too great, too big, and turned out to be low by a factor of 100 when we actually started taking data. So, you know, you do take risks with your career even by you know, proposing reasonably responsible things to do. Uh, in terms of other aspects of high energy physics, of course, we, uh, we, we specialize in building devices that have never been built before and delivering them on time and on budget. And uh, occasionally we crash and burn and uh, it turns out the most difficult things to build are power supplies, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah. Something that nobody ever built before you can do. But when it comes to building a thousand low voltage power supplies to you know, distribute uh, electricity around the, uh, the front end of the detector, turns out nearly always you have to replace these after a year because you didn't get it right. So, uh, but in terms of really difficult things, I, I remember a, a quote from Ed Temple, who was one of the draconian reviewers that the DOE would send around to review pro all sorts of projects or the you know, government projects. And he commented on the, again, this was the experiment at CERN, that uh, you know, we, were, 
we're a bit iffy at the 10%, 20% level about whether we would really keep the scope and the budget exactly uh, together. Uh, his comment was he just finished reviewing a Pentagon conventional construction project of a building, and that seemed to be a factor of three over budget. It seems we can build high energy physics uh, things correct to 10 or 20%, and yet, as, as anybody who's constructed anything knows, conventional building is always uncertain to a large factor. So it's, it's fascinating uh, see, seeing this happen. And of course, we're very adept at the really horrible failures. Uh, they didn't exist. It, that, that never happened. So you, we won't talk about those. I have a follow-up follow -up question here, because we talked about this decade-long uh, timescale for LEC, for example. But right now, <clears throat> you have been operating, you have been taking data. There's a second phase. There's an upgrade phase. Mm -hmm. And you still have to now upgrade the computing. So first of all, you have a different problem. You cannot disrupt ongoing operations, which now is somehow a little bit more similar to what Jeff is doing in Google. At the same time, are you capable of taking more risks now? Because you have a shorter time scale, you have a lot more knowledge about the system you both have and what you need. Or do you still have the same kind of problems, but even made worse by the fact that you're actually taking data at the same time? We do have a lot of problems keeping something successful going at the same time as doing something new and exciting. You know, there's a balance between uh, you know, if it's sufficiently new and exciting, all the really capable people flock to that, and the existing systems can fall on the floor, uh, or it can go, go the other way. Uh, it's a very good time to bring in, uh, if you can't bring in a lot of new money, at least to bring in a lot of new people. Uh, we, we see this in other major software projects that we have, that you know, a, a thing like the Geo4 simulation code, which now serves most of high energy physics and quite a lot of space exploration and medical physics and things like this. Uh, of course, you know, this is a code that started life in 1994 uh, and has got an ongoing life, presumably, for another couple of decades. And it needs utterly major rethinking and revision, uh, revision for GPUs and microprocessors and all, all the future of computing hardware. But it has such a huge and, de and uh, demanding user base, including all of the LHC program, that you just can't stop doing what you're now doing and go and do something else. So there, the, the exciting thing is to involve additional people to do some of the really high-risk exploratory research about how you, you transform this simulation code, which uses most of the computing that we have uh, for the future, at the same time as uh, keeping the hundred people that now work on it, uh, keeping the lights on, keeping the physics uh, improved from day to day as the, as the needs arise. Um, it's not generally too hard, uh, to be perfectly honest. If you have an exciting new challenge ahead, then a little bit of management tweaking is required to make sure that you don't lose the key people from the existing uh, things, but it's actually uh, not generally too hard to get people really, really interested in doing the, the new things. Of course, money is another matter. Money is always a horrible thing, but <laughs> I'm not talking about it. I have some bad experiences last week. Um, okay. so My question for Jeff. Uh, so, you know, on top of the stack you mentioned, there is also F1 introduced afterwards and so on. It's like, it, you obviously see, you know, you're providing more and more of infrastructure software for the teams to build upon and take away their, their bread of, you know, them thinking about how to solve the data problems. It's like, are you happy that, you know, there's this kind of progression, not that just having F1 style software like earlier and having product teams not think as much about efficiencies? Like, what, what is your perspective from how, how that, you know, ability for product teams to understand low level uh, data at extra large scale matters? So uh, just for context, F1 is the essentially the lowest level of the ad system that is built on top of Spanner. So it sort of uh, provides the ads, a little bit of a custom ads logic, uh, that, and sits on top of our infrastructure. And I think, um, you know, in a lot of cases, the reason you're building these layered systems is because having abstraction boundaries is a useful, useful thing in being able to decouple one piece of your system from another. Uh, for a lot of the reasons that Greg was talking about, you know, you want to have these nice, simple interfaces that you can then go 
and have a team work on improving our distributed file system, and when they make some improvements, slide that in, and everyone benefits. Um, and I think the same thing is true for Spanner. Spanner solves a bunch of problems that a bunch of different teams have, and so having teams build something on top of Spanner is, is actually quite useful because they can then benefit from a lot of the core features we put into Spanner to meet the needs of a bunch of different clients, right? So I, I think you know, it's a win-win to do it as a piece of infrastructure that many different teams can benefit from. Yeah, I've got a microphone. Um, so this is a question for all three of you or any of you who want to answer. Which <coughs> failure are you most proud of? Which failure? Which yeah, which of, which of your projects has failed spectacularly and which you learned a lot from? Mm. <laughs> there are so many. <laughs> what a great question. Yeah, yeah, yeah I would, I would for, for me, the, um, uh, from, from the Sun era was the black, black box, which was uh, a push towards containerized computing, really trying to go push, you know, completely lights out, automated, uh, high density, um, di basically take a shipping container and fill it full of systems and, and shut the door at the, at the, the outside. And, and, um, and, I, and that, was a great, that was actually a lot of fun. Um, so it was a fun failure in the sense that, you know, we thought this kind of thing could take over the world and you end up doing, you know, only a few hundred of them at the, the end of the day. Uh, uh, you, you quickly found out that, um, you know, things like where you want to install it, that people giving you code approval wanted to tell you that it was a building, not a computer. And, you know, so it's, it's, it, was, it was a really... It was a really fascinating sort of lesson in the interface between, um, you know, reality and your dreams about building big systems, and, you know. Uh, but that was a fun one. The first one, by the way, was uh, deployed yeah, Slack. at Slack. Yeah. Yes. And it, was, uh, it wasn't black. Yeah. No, and Slack it just... wasn't black. It was white. We, we also yeah. <laughs> Slack just shut down its two yeah. white boxes. And they worked well, didn't and they? They, they yeah. worked well, yeah. yes. Um, OK, too many to mention, as you say. Yeah. Um, I, I'll tell you two. I mean, the first one was uh, that way back, I can't remember when, these two guys, uh, Robert Cayo and Tim Berners-Lee, came along and presented this idea that they had for some you know, HTTP-linked, hypertext-linked uh, information system, and they thought it would be really useful for our experiment. And I... I I couldn't see what we were going to do with this, right? <laughs> <laughs> what possibly could that be? The next one is more complex. Uh, and of course, I can blame lots of other people for the failure, but uh, because it's more complex. The, uh, way back in 2004 or so, uh, it became uh, painfully obvious to me that we were really beginning to suffer from the fact that disks looked like tapes even then. You know, they, for, uh, in, the early, in the early 90s, we latched on to disks and started using them as true random access devices because the processors were then so slow that the disks could actually go around and deliver stuff fast enough to keep processors busy. And then as the 1990s rolled on and uh, we, we got f finally into the 2000s, it became very clear that uh, you couldn't work in that way. Uh, and we had other alternatives of latency hiding and uh, having committees decide what you would filter out from a petabyte scale data set and put on a terabyte scale data set so that people could then access that in a fairly agile way. But I got to think, well, couldn't we get back to that wonderful random access world where you could have an idea in the shower in the morning and uh, you didn't in those days have any access from home to your computer. You went into work and you could then analyze the data in that way, accessing it in any way you liked right away. And so I, I dreamed up a, uh, a project and uh, a technology which was actually flash memory because you know, it seemed like a good idea uh, to, to make a system 
that would have a sufficient flash memory cache that everything people were doing would appear to come from random access memory. Of course, it, there'd be a huge amount of disk behind it. Uh, what, uh, apart from innumerable funding gotchas, because this was all Department of Energy and, and so on, which I will not go into, what really got me and made this project not succeed was the fact that when you created a prototype and you ran on it the software that we currently have, it didn't do any good. And that was because the software we currently had has got, had man decades, uh, many decades of effort going into making sure that the latency of the underlying storage, which looks like tape, was effectively hidden and you couldn't get to any low latency device in any way that was useful. So, you know, it just was completely hidden from you. And there would be, again, man decades of work to strip out all that latency hiding and give the physicist access to the, uh, the low latency device. So in the end, you know, that, that sort of never got anywhere, although I'm sure that idea will get there so somewhere. And, and it gives me a lead in to take some issue with one of Jeff's points, which was, you know, don't get out too far ahead of your market, if you're your internal market for, you know, don't start inventing things just because you know you can do them. And here, of course, is a failure story, so maybe I'm illustrating that this is correct. But I, of course, I still don't believe it was really a failure. It was only somebody else's fault. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> The problem is the, the need is there, but for most people who use the system, they were completely, the demand for low latency access to data had been completely suppressed by two decades of graduate student experience. No, you can't do that. If you try to do it, you'll have a bad time. And people had stopped thinking about it. So if people stop thinking about what technology could deliver for them, sometimes the technologists have to try and start delivering it and make it happen. We had a question here. Oh, you, well, that's fine. <laughs> oh, come on. Well, it's okay. <laughs> Jeff, go ahead. Uh, okay, I, I will think of two failures. Uh, one is kind of along the lines of what Richard was talking about, where we <clears throat> had built actually a pretty nice experimental system for trying out new kinds of ranking algorithms and integrating new kinds of information into our search system. Um, and it had a bunch of extra capabilities that our production system didn't work, didn't, didn't have. Uh, but we figured people would find uses for being able to look at this extra kind of data. And it turned out people didn't really want to use that system because there was no obvious path to get um, something that worked really well in that environment that took advantage of its capabilities into production. Uh, so eventually we had to end up putting a lot of these capabilities into our production systems before people would actually be willing to think about using these new facilities. Uh, sort of along the same lines, you, we uh, knew it would be useful, but we had to actually sort of build it in a more robust way before people were willing to take advantage of it. And the second thing I think is uh, we viola violated my own advice with Spanner where we didn't kind of work in close concert with a uh, sort of initial client uh, at the very from the very start it took us a little while to latch onto one of that kind of delayed things as we fumbled around with our APIs a bit until we got settled. Hello, <clears throat> hello. Uh, I have a question to Greg. Uh, actually, it's two questions um, kind of related. So one of your messages was, if you have a great idea, you can just use commodity tools and internet right now and become successful business. So what's the role of venture capital for this kind of um, uh, idea? So what kind of businesses lend themselves naturally to venture capitalists versus just developing business yourself? And a related question, uh, so what's the process? You know, I've been um, uh, successful in the government gr grants, uh, but what's the process of venture capitalists? Do you accept proposals? Do you have panels? What's the procedure? Okay, well, the, the, the first one is, um, I think the role for venture capital is to go, you know, use somebody else's money to do the scaling, right? So you're, it's in, in many ways, what we specialize in is how to take ideas and scale them into companies that become, you know, the next Google or, or you know, your, your, whatever your, your view is on success there. But uh, for us, it's large outcomes. And so it's, it's a, um, the process there is really one of, 
of, of company building and, 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 and that has lots and lots of dimensions to it. Um, in, in terms of process of going about it, um, it's, this is a networked world, right? So it's, it's like, uh, send me your, what your idea you're working on, right? Greg P at NEA.com. So I, I, for people who are interested in this, it's re it really is, uh, I'm serious about that, it's, it's the way into venture funding is who do you know who's in your network or somebody who knows somebody and to get those style of introductions. Those are, it's, it's really about people. And, and I, I would just say that as I love the place I work in NEA is, is a fabulous culture. The, what I like about that culture is that it's fundamentally a place that in, is about the entrepreneurs and we invest in people more than probably anything else in our rubric. And I can go through all the list of things that we're, we look at on, on you know, technology levels, but if the people aren't there, it's, it, we don't do it. There was a question here. Hi, um, so from software, two of you are software makers and two, the other two were software uh, funders of makers. Um, how does open source uh, relate to what you, how, is it pros and cons, is it good, is it valuable, has it got problems for what you do for e from each one of you? Um, so our environment is a little unusual in that we, uh, tend to build a lot of our own infrastructure for a lot of the reasons that uh, um, other large data management systems have is that they have fairly specialized needs in some cases. So most of our infrastructure we build ourselves. Some pieces of it we open source, uh, so that, because we, especially ones that are kind of not as dependent on the rest of our systems. Uh, it's fairly easy for us to, to open source some things. Some of the things that we publish papers about, the open source community uh, likes the papers and produces open source versions um, of them. And I think that's a healthy interchange. You know, the, part of the reason we published the MapReduce paper is we knew it would be very useful for kind of large scientific uh, communities that are having similar kinds of problems with managing large amounts of data. And I think the, the fact that Hadoop was developed is actually we didn't know who would develop it, but we knew someone would do an open source version of it, and I think that was that was a, a healthy outcome from that. So, so as I said on my slide, uh, you know, we're we're very leery of commercial software for many reasons, um, practical reasons. Open source we generally like, uh, as, especially when it's a sufficiently good and well widely supported that it looks like it'll have a relevant lifetime for what we want to do. Uh, in terms of how much can we rely on open source, I, I think it's very clear that nobody is going to produce uh, from a, some open source movement uh, software that will deal with the physics simulations that we want to do, uh, uh, things like this. I mean, this is something that we have to get funded and get people paid to do. Of course, we like to release the software as open source because, you know, Firstly, it is encouraged by the people who pay for the software to be created, and secondly, it, it does encourage the aggregation of a slightly wider community than the people who were initially pay, paid to do it. Uh, other things, of course, uh, you know, if this is tantalizing when we look at our worldwide data and workflow management software, could something like this become part of a really mature, open source, widely supported, widely used pro product so that its architecture gets better and the, the load of developing and supporting this largely goes from the individual end user communities that we have. So yes, I mean, open source means many things, both the way you release software, the way you have software created, and you have to understand all these aspects of it, but Basically, it's although I started my life in high energy physics software before the concept of open source existed at all, uh, it's definitely there to stay. Yeah, I would say actually, you, you may be surprised by the answer, but we, we, we like the model a lot in, uh, as an investing model, um, mainly, you know, mainly because it's such a powerful adoption. Um, tool in the market. I mean, there are lots of people. I think if, if you're anywhere in those infrastructure layers uh, d down below, 
um, you have to be open uh, to, to attract attention of anyone because there's just not trust uh, for, I'm gonna bring in some proprietary code that's in the middle of that service that I'm trying to build. <laughs> Okay, now there's a bit of a paradox there because for people who are building those API exported services and um, uh, those generally tend to be proprietary, right? You, you stare into an API and it's exactly, you know, ignore the person behind the curtain there, right? That it's, it's uh, however we did that is okay. And we seem philosophically, people, we, and, and I bet you there are lots of people in your shop who go use API, you know, network APIs without really thinking that that was in fact like adopting um, uh, proprietary software. But I, I think back to the, if you're doing infrastructure and open source, um, it's a very, very powerful business tool because it's a, it, it reduces friction to adoption and that's part of this, you know, um, get to the market uh, inexpensively and, and, and powerfully. You, you obviously have to back end that with a, a business model that makes sense. And, and it's gotta be more than support. So, uh, you know, typically the, uh, the models are evolving you know, depending if you're an open source purist, you sort of puke when, when you hear the words, but open core, uh, that, that makes sure people have sort of this stable, you can go on and do this thing with the centerpiece and we'll decorate it with, with proprietary, uh, you know, extensions. And, um, and I think that, that tries to, to, to split, uh, split the, the debate on it. But, but I will just add one thing, is that from a business, it's actually more expensive to, uh, to conduct yourself as an open source uh, company because you've got, you have more support that you have to do and more engagement with your community outside. So question for Greg. Uh, so one of the uh, needle in a haystack problem is actually you finding the right startup, right? Uh, so do you think uh, using big data, using enough uh, analytics, uh, uh, you know, tests on founders and ideas, and at various stage uh, looking at the company, you can actually make a more predictive model, or is it mostly a random walk? No, I, it's a great, it, that's a great question. And I, you know, um, I, I, we are in the business, unfortunately, of, of the haystack and, and um, <laughs> that problem. I, you know, the, the numbers from, from our firm is that um, we, we look at something like three to 5,000 uh, opportunities a year, and we find about 30 of them. Um, and um, and we don't think we don't think we're getting in front of nearly enough, right? That may be 80 percent of sort of what people go classically around to go make companies, but we're actually looking a lot at this. And I, I think there is something here, and it's more than just a can I use big data, you know, analytics to go look to find trending things. There's there is a huge amount of of signal that comes out of all kinds of uh, things of, you know, from terms that people search on, you know, those are sort of obvious signals, but, but, but there, there's a lot there. And, and I think we're kind of in that era, we're collectively in that era of, uh, <clears throat> of understanding what all this stuff means. And, and, you know, Jeff and I had a little bit of a side conversation about, you know, you know what, what, what's happening with machine learning and neural nets and all these kind of things. And it, it does feel like that, that this connectivity of things and getting these signals out, we can do a lot more than our traditional approaches to, to business or science or project management. We'll see. We're the generations to watch here. I see one more over there. Hi, this question is for Jeff. Um, you've mentioned that when building systems, we should not try to be all things to all people. Um, you've worked on the original MapReduce, I presume, and uh, probably scoped some six problems or so, but you've probably seen some problems that could not be solved properly by MapReduce. I'm wondering if you would care to maybe draw the line, like what's outside, what's inside the solution space. Sure. Uh, I mean, I think it's an incredibly useful tool. It's applicable to a broader range of problems than you might think. Uh, that being said, it's important not to use it where it's not applicable. Um, one, one thing I think people often don't realize is that it's pretty easy to build a whole data processing pipeline out of a sequence of MapReduces. 
And that's often a pretty effective tool at organizing some more complex thing than fits in a single operation. Um, for very kind of fine grain iterative computations, uh, for example, I'm building systems now that are doing uh, uh, gradient descent training of large neural networks. And those iterations, you want to sort of pro go up and down this, this model on the order of every 30 milliseconds. And that kind of fine grain updating of, of state is not really what MapReduce was designed to do, um, at least our current implementation. I think you could actually have a very different implementation that might be appropriate for that kind of time scale. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, mostly it tends to be these kind of iterative computations that uh, people can squeeze into the MapReduce paradigm and it sometimes doesn't work out as well as it might. So there are a bunch of us old functional programming folks who go, why, how did we miss that? These are combinators. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, I think we're um, a little bit behind. So it's lunchtime, so I would like to thank the panelists and speakers for a great session.